unmute. Good afternoon all. Um, before I begin, just a few housekeeping rules. If you can ensure you're on mute while the speakers are speaking, that would be much appreciated. This session is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Tuffy Cymru channels posted on the Knowledge Hub in a few days. If you do have any concerns regarding this, please do email us. And please feel free to use the chat box to ask any questions as we go along. Um, but as you all know, we do want it to be an interactive session, so please feel free to um, either raise your hand or just unmute yourselves. So welcome to this month's session um, on, of our Integrated Pest and Disease Management Network. And we are joined again by Peter Seymour and Chris Creed. So I'll hand over to you. Perfect, thanks Sarah. Um, so yeah, it's another instalment about pests in soft fruit. Um, today is a, a sort of group of pests that I've done a fair amount of work in the last couple of years and I have a certain notoriety to them as well. Um, and it's the thrips. So we're looking at thrips in edible crops, mostly focusing on soft fruit. Um, and we're including some information on pests and uh, natural enemies as well that you might find in the crops. So I guess the main question is, to those that don't know, what are thrips? Now, first of all, I'm going to start off by saying um, a caveat that the plural, the, uh, the singular of thrips is still thrips. There's no such thing as a thrip. So if there are any points in this presentation where it's starting to wind you up because it looks like I'm talking in plural all the time, that is indeed why I'm not going insane. So thrips are one to two mil in size, very, very small. You can see in the bottom right hand image, in fact, a rough idea of what you'd see looking at a strawberry flower with thrips. Um, and they have a very, very wide host range. Um, Western flower thrips alone has 250 different species um, and there are many many more species than that as well um, and they all have quite a wide host range bar a few. Um, so I've, I've cherry picked a few examples things like strawberries, cucumbers, tomatoes, the ornamental sector which isn't really relevant for this pre presentation but they have quite a few issues with them um, and also quite a large number of weed and wildflower species. Now this becomes important later um, but it's especially important because it means they're a point of introduction to your very valuable crops. Now, if you're going to go looking for thrips within a crop, especially within soft fruit, you typically want to be looking around the flower head and around the petals. They are um, pollen feeders as well as um, they'll feed a little bit on plant tissue. They're a sucking pest um, and they cause damage by egg implantation and this feeding. Now, the damage can vary depending on what the crop is, but within strawberries, you get quite distinctive, strong bronzing to white and red fruit that can make it uh, the value drop or make it unsellable. Um, you can also end up with um, bronzing, no, sorry, browning of petals um, and white flecking and damage to leaves. So it can also lead to, if in large enough numbers, you can also start to see frass or uh, essentially excrement from the thrips on the sort of leaves, which can also be grounds for sort of uh, rejection by a consumer. Um, and additionally, some of the species, Western flower thrips, can actually transmit viruses, which can start to extrapolate the sort of damage that they can cause. Now, it's not all bad news with some species of thrips, it can be very localized distribution. There'll be uh, an area where the lentil of the crop um, and they may not distribute that far into a crop or you might start to see over the years um, them appearing in the same place again and again. This is less true with Western flower thrips, but I'm going to come to that in a little bit. Chris, as normal, do chuck in if you've got any sort of thoughts. Yeah, or... I was just thinking, Peter, um, what about weather conditions? Because seem to find a, a huge amount more thrips when the sun's out than when it's sort of dull and overcast. I'm yeah. wondering if they go deeper in the flowers or they're just, I think if you really want to find them, then you go looking where it's like a day like, well, like we've got here today, really hot and sunny. And then you, you seem to find a bit more, not so deep in the flower maybe, or they just don't come into the flowers more when it's sunny. They're a bit more active, um, but also higher temperatures allow them to move around the crop a li little bit more readily. Um, and allows them to fly. I know uh, Western th flower thrips need a temperature of around 21, off the top of my head, around 21 degrees for them to be able to fly readily. Um, so obviously in a polytunnel, that's a little bit easier for them. Um, but they also um, are, 
transmitted by they can obviously ride the the wind speeds from crop to crop as well so that's another distribution method rather than just temperature but they they can be a bit more active i wouldn't go looking for thrips um after it's been the heavy rain because they will probably be uh, especially in an outdoor crop because you will struggle to see them at all um but even on covered crops i would still probably recommend looking for them on a hotter drier day where you'll find what them a little bit more um, thresholds are you you, do you think, Pete? I mean, if you see Western Spartans, I think, you know, even if you just get one or two in a crop, it's um, it's, it's a time to get something done. Yeah, Western Plathrips are um, commonly considered to have a lower threshold. And as soon as you start sealing that, seeing them, you want to be dealing with them. Um, and we'll go into more detail about their control later. Um, but they breed so heavily and quickly in a crop that as soon as you start seeing them, you want to be dealing with them. And their main methods of control are heavily focused and revolve around dealing with their larval stages rather than the adults. So if you start getting very, very large adult populations, they can be very, very difficult to deal with. Um, the other species that we see that are starting to become or have been found to be more of an issue lately, um, they would probably have a little bit higher of a threshold. You can get away with a few thrips per flower, but you will start to see bronzing around that point. Um, there's a large debate about whether um, cultivar or variety of um, plant species will affect the level of damage. Um, the jury's still out there. I know a couple of our colleagues have said that um, some cultivars, if they've got higher upward facing flowers, um, they're considered more attractive to thrips. Um, but you, and then you get some that say that there are some cultivars that are resistant to damage, but we've never really been able to do a study into it. Um, and it's a lot of mixed opinions on it. So it's a tricky the other one. thing, Peter, is that um, ever bearers, because they're in flower for two or three months, um, they can be vulnerable uh, any week of the year from um, the end, well, from the, the end of April onwards, really. Yeah, yeah. So they they can be at risk for a long period of time, and, and the species that build up over a long uh, that build up very quickly in the crop, like Western flower thrips. Are going to be more of a danger to um, the longer standing crops as they start to build up. I've seen western flathrips uh, really start to develop sort of uncontrollably before in sort of August time where it's just starting to steamroller away a little bit more than the control, um, especially as it has in many areas been found to have uh, insecticide resistance. Um, Although the sort of transient species of thrips that migrate into the crop that don't really breed in the crop um, they're probably more of a hassle for things uh, like June bearers, where they've only got a short window of cropping, uh, which is high value, but these thrips are only around in that window. So it can vary depending on the cropping that you're producing, um, as well as what the type of thrips are. Um, so I'm very briefly going to touch on life cycle again in the other presentations I've touched on this mainly as a means to sort of help explain issues with control that people have had. Um, but essentially it follows a very basic cycle of um, the adults will lay eggs and plant tissue. Um, this will help keep them protected. These will then hatch into larvae, which are active and moving around the crop. They can cause a little bit of damage. Um, and there are, as we've discussed just now, species like Western flower thrips that breed more readily in the crop or more actively. Um, and then you've got the pupil stage, which is barely mobile, if at all. Now, at this point, they typically drop down into the soil or growing media to find some shelter to pupate. And then they'll then emerge as adults, which are then mobile, can fly as temperatures are suitable or is using the wind. Um, and Chris touched on everbearer crops risk, um, but single year crops are typically less at risk um, from things like Western flower thrips because you're removing the plant and any built up pest population from the previous year. Obviously, there's positives to keeping a crop over for an extra year, but it's if you have got issues with Western flower thrips, that can be um, quite a risk in some areas. Um, so that's the kind of basic life cycle, and it will become a little bit more relevant shortly. Now, within soft through, um, a lot of the research has been strawberry focused um, because that's been a lot of the areas where there's been high levels of damage seen. Um, the main sort of two that we've kind of been doing research on are Western flower thrips, which has had a lot of research exp uh, exploring it over the years, including things like host range, methods of control. Um, but in 
recent years, there's been other species like rose thrips, rubus thrips, all these other species that have been attributed to also causing damage in the crop. And we know there are a lot more knowledge gaps involved with these species. Um, so we've got those five spe uh, six species on the top that we either know for sure or believe strongly that cause damage in crops and they vary in um, the numbers seen and they're often um, seen as a species mix so it's less clear cut where you'll see just western flower thrips or just rose thrips you'll often see a little bit of a mix but sometimes with a dominant species present um, but again not all bad news there are some species of thrips that we see in crops that aren't necessarily damaging them or in the case of the aeolothrips, the predatory species, um, are actively help combat other thrip species and they'll feed on thrips larvae. Um, we don't believe that they feed on thrips adults. Um, and then there's also the cereal thrips. Um, now there's a few species of those and you'll typically find them come in when arable crops nearby, if there are arable crops near to you, um, your horticultural crops have been harvested. Um, and or areas of grassland and things like that where they've been using that they've been using as a host range now we haven't found any sort of attributed damage to that but it does mean that you might see high numbers of thrips at times but less bronzing um, or less damage to the crop and that would probably be explained as the cereal thrips so what about um, id then Pete? so obviously those two pictures you got there on the screen sorry the previous slide yeah and they're more or less identical, aren't they? I mean, don't you have to get under a microscope to be able to tell WFT from rose thrips and things? Yep, I've got a couple of slides and a little bit touching on that because there's a few methods which oh, you right. can use. Um, but microscope is best. Um, so that's a bit more of an in-depth image of cereal and predatory thrips. Predatory thrips, which you can actually see with a hand lens or in the flowers, you can see these zebra banded wings that you can see just here. Um, and they are visible um, using a hand lens or to the naked eye, which is really helpful for determining whether numbers of thrips that you're seeing are uh, the predatory sort and benefiting you, or they're the other thrip species that you want to be careful of. Now, so the thrips issue, we've been seeing fruit bronzing on strawberry crops since sort of 2013. Now, this was in areas where Western flower thrips had been well controlled. Um, and this is where it started to become apparent that damage was being caused by other species of thrips and it wasn't all Western flower thrips, which is where we started to need to come up with different methods and an understanding of these other species, rather than sort of relegating them to, oh, they don't really do much. We need to focus on Western flower thrips. So we were speaking- um, That's a really good picture that, Peter, because it, it shows you that thrippy flower and that so yeah. that early bronzing on the fruit. So, so if, you, if you've seen symptoms like that, especially on indoor crops where they don't get battered from the weather, you'll see those um, flowers and those are the ones that tap out on your hand to the thrips. And if you're seeing that damage, I don't think much else causes that other than thrips. No, um, powdery mildew can cause similar-ish looking bronzing, but not the petal damage. Um, but powdery mildew sort of uh, lesions after the mildew's gone tend to be very red rather than a dark brown. Um, I've seen occasional bits of friction damage to fruit being caused, but that's typically on one facing and it won't cover the entire thing like in this image. Um, this was in an area where in a previous assessment a few weeks before, in 10, uh, in 20 flowers, we'd seen 46 thrips. So you're looking at a rough sort of average of around two to three thrips per flower with this. So it, the thresholds can be low if, if left to their own device or if they're intensified. So we've seen at, at times, if you're in between a flush of flowers, all your thrips numbers get intensified into a smaller number of flowers, um, rather than say, if you've got five flowers per plant, you've got a much wider range of, um, a much wider range of selection for these thrips to go in so those 46 thrips might have distributed themselves into say 60 flowers instead. And then, then at that point, your threshold's lower. But when you've got less flowers, you've got a higher chance of damage and risk occurring. Um, so the reason why recognizing species of thrips is, is really important is that, I mean, primarily the, the big bad, the, the main issue, Western flower thrips, 
is often uh, resistant to chemical insecticides. Um, would, you, would you say often there, Peter, or always? I would say often, uh, I, but that's probably erring on the side of caution with how I define it. Um, um, but it's quite often an indicator when you've applied a spray of a, 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 a sort of chemical insecticide with a known kind of good history of killing thrips. And if it doesn't really do what you're expecting it to do, then suddenly Western flower thrips looks to be the culprit. Um, and I say often resistant because you might not get, um, it might be that not all of them are completely resistant. And so you get partial control, but I wouldn't, if you've got Western flower thrips, I would be very quickly not looking to use your limited reserves of chemical insecticides in trying to deal with it because it, you're then losing them for other pests as well. Um, and there are, for Western flower thrips, thankfully, some very, very good biological controls in dealing with them. However, that relies on a number of things, which I'll start to go into a bit more later. And that's where the second point that IPM measures are species dependent. Um, a lot of these transient species of thrips that we're discussing um, just before that come into the crop later on in waves, best to, to, to the best of our knowledge, we don't think they're breeding in the crop. So measures that are designed for dealing with larvae or things like predatory thrips that will also deal with larvae aren't really going to affect these species of thrips. So it's important to know what you're dealing with to avoid things like the bronzing damage over here. Um, thrips absolutely love uh, flowering plants, so weeds are a good introduction for them. Um, the positive side is that most of the other transient species of thrips, the ones that migrate in, are typically killed by tracer. Now the balance that you're trying to obviously uh, keep is that a lot of people want to keep tracer for things like SWD control, but there's a balance to be struck as always. Um, and we have also seen pyrethroid resistance in uh, the onion thrips, thrips to back it, um, in UK sort of allium crops previously. So there is the potential for resistance to be developed uh, in these other species if we're not careful. And now, the thing about um, tracer, Peter, is that it, it is actually organic, so you can use it in an organic system. Good point to make. Thank you, Chris. Um, so Chris touched upon identification. I showed two images earlier that, uh, as Chris mentioned, looked basically identical. Getting 100% confirmation of a, uh, of a species can only really be done under a high power microscope. You've, as you can see from the image, You've got a thrips there that's one to two mil in size, and you've got a few of the different features there in images, and that splits between two species. It's the length of some hairs and the abundance or absence of some a couple of pores. There's not a chance that you will be able to see that with a hand lens, funnily enough. Um, so things like the number of antennal segments, hair behind the eyes, number of hairs on wings, all that kind of thing are the things you really need to be doing to identify what the actual species is truly. Um, and that's typically done through lab analysis and sending a sample off. Um, there are, we have done a workshop in the past for the HDB, which was looking at using um, just uh, agronomy methods for look, uh, determining um, species difference in a crop. Um, I've given a very, very abridged version here, which is using color. Now, it's a very potential indicator. I can't stress that enough. Typically the more yellowy brown kind of species are things like Western flower thrips or the flower thrips, which is very similar to Western flower thrips or the onion thrips. They're typically a little bit paler or lighter, but that does depend on diet, temperature, a whole variety of other factors. So it's not, it's not conclusive by any stretch, uh, but if you're trying to get an idea um, or if you've got species that are dark brown, they're typically gonna be things like the rubus thrips, the rose thrips, which are looking more like this image here. And then you've got the even slightly larger thrips, which are also very, very dark, where you've got the predatory and the cereal thrips. Now, when I say larger, we're talking a few millimeters. They look a little bit larger and a bit more bulky and solid. Um, but you're not looking at any kind of really obvious or distinct differences. This is more to try and give you a means for a gut reaction early in the season to then help try and inform IPM. Now, when we start straying into methods of control, you've got a variety of biological controls. Um, so again, I keep, I'm like a broken record with this, but it is very species dependent. So you've got um, the predatory mite, Neocelis cucumerus, or 
often known and still marketed as Amblyseus cucumerus. Now that's a predatory mite, um, available quite, uh, I'd say relatively cheaply, Chris, you can generally get it in the crop in quite a large uh, number. Yeah, so I think it's, um, if, you, if you've got ever bearers, you typically, typically be putting on 25 uh, mites per plant per fortnight. And that, you know, that, that you, you, you're treating about uh, four plants for a penny. So you can get that in fairly cheaply and quite early as well. Um, you can start as soon as it starts flowering, you can start getting new uh, Ambly uh, in the crop. Um, unfortunately, main limitation, it only feeds on Thrix larvae um, to the best of what we can really determine. It may occasionally have a pop at an adult, but you're not getting any kind of steady means of control there. Um, so with that you need to be very very mindful of that life cycle which i mentioned earlier if you've got species that breed in the crop then then things like amboseus is very very useful and that's why it's pr primarily used for dealing with western flower thrips in a very preventative manner from as soon as the season really starts because if you can keep on top of western flower thrips and their larvae um, levels using things like ambly then you will have a lot less problems later on However, if they've built up to be in high numbers of larvae per plant, then things like Amberley, you'll need to really have them at very high levels in order to get the control you need. And that's gonna be very difficult and take time. Um, there's another species that was formerly known as Hyperaspis miles. Now this feeds on larvae and pupae, um, but that's within the soil uh, or growing media. So that, that has a sort of different uh, sort of area that it's mostly predating in. Um, and then you've got the generalist aureus, Lavagartus. Now that's commercially available and it does feed on larvae and adults. So this is one of the main biological controls being used for, against things like the rose thrips that are migrating into the crop that don't seem to be breeding in any large levels at all. Um, so they're, they're good at dealing with the adults and are a strong component of a sort of balanced means of dealing with thrips in the crop. Um, they can also be naturally occurring, which is a, an extra bonus, a free uh, sort of biological control that can help you out. Um, limitation with them, though, is that they can be very temperature dependent. Um, you need the temperature to be above around 15 degrees consistently, generally. Um, otherwise, they'll start going into diapause, um, not laying eggs and slowly starving. So if you're introducing them and paying money to introduce them to the crop, you need to be very mindful about the temperature that you're putting them in. And that typically avoiding a tip a very strong calendar approach but it's normally around mid to uh early to mid june depending on the, the year that you start seeing people introduce these into the crop um and then you've got a variety of potential options using chemical control within soft fruit tracer is probably the most commonly used uh, for dealing with the non chemically resistant um species of thrips however also useful for other pests um, there are also products like Flipper, which are a lot newer to the market, and I know there's still a little bit of debate within some of our consultants about how uh, effective it will be. Um, have you had any use of it, Chris, against thrips? Yeah, I'm seeing it used a lot against aphids. Um, I couldn't comment on um, what it's like on thrips, but um, you know, it's um, it's useful to have anything you know that you can try. But um, if you do use Flipper, you've got to make sure you stick to the label and you do. You know, it's got to go in soft water, etc., and um, you need to get you know really good coverage. It's not too bad getting coverage on flowers. It's much harder getting coverage on leaf backs, but um, you know it's um, it's all there is. Um, the other thing you know, about these plant protection products is if you um, start using chemical pesticides on resistant um, populations, then you actually make it worse because you you're wiping out what predators there are. So you've got to be really careful before you make a choice of going down the chemical route. If you think you've got Western flower thrips, then just give up on it and go straight on to ITDM and using your um, introduced predators. Yeah, that's a really good point because uh, with Western flower thrips, it is those biologicals that are going to deal with it. And so you're sort of taking uh, no steps forward, but a few steps back um, in your sort of steps to deal with them, um, which is again, where having a little bit of knowledge about what you're seeing is a good, good thing and also having a strong idea early on as to when they're starting to build up um the migrating thrips will start appearing when the temperatures start increasing and they'll start appearing in uh, low numbers but then they'll build up quickly 
whereas things like western flathrips will be there persistently and will start then building up and increasing in pressure. Um, and then when the temperature picks up, that's when they really start to take off. There was a question that popped up, Peter, about um, Spursky eye, but um, you, I don't know if you cover in other predatory mites later on. I don't actually. Um, sorry, I can't see the question because I've got 1001 tabs open. Is it? Um, that's because I'm. Could you read the question yeah, directly I mean, for me, Chris? Yeah. Could you also advise them to see a swear ski eye? Um, this one is actually something. Well, actually, yes, yeah, swear ski is um, rated again uh, for thrips larvae. Um, so mostly focused on thrips larvae. I haven't had any personal experience with it. I don't know if you have, Chris. Well, you know, you've seen a lot of different um, species of uh, mites, predatory mites introduced now, and um, but, you know, some say they're all the rage. They tend to be used more in ornamentals, but um, to be honest, I'm, I'm not sure of uh, how effective these other species are. Yeah, I know, um, as you say, there's quite a wide variety of available options, um, but I'll, I'll say what I regularly see in crop is sachets of Amblyseus cucumerus. That's if I'm going visiting different sites that I, I don't advise, I don't advise sites. So what I'm regularly seeing is that, and they tend to have less issues um, with Western flathrips compared to others that we've sort of seen. So I think it's a, a cautious, um, it could work out, but equally there are some strong options already available. Um, okay, I'll move that tab back. So that brings us on to detecting when thrips are appearing. Now, you've got two main methods for generally telling when thrips are appearing in the crops. Now, the first one, which I think is probably the best overall, is flower inspections. So it's best to be checking the flowers regularly as soon as they start opening. Um, the open flowers visually and uh, attract the thrips, um, and they can, depending on the species, start laying eggs in the crop. Um, you, when you're monitoring the flowers, you want to be picking upward facing flowers. Imagine if the thrips are flying over, that upward facing flower with all those white petals is a much stronger visual cue than one that's just kind of face down underneath a few leaves. So when you're using those to, to do inspections, you're best off picking those upward facing ones. And you want to be picking slightly sort of middle aged flowers with shed pollen, a bit darker brown, um, because if they're bright orange, pollen, um, they're typically not going to have been open for as long and there's less likely um, thrips in there, which can give you an artificial idea that thrips numbers are lower than they actually are. So selection of flowers can be very important for working out what, what the numbers of flowers, uh, what the number of thrips are within the crop. It's also a good opportunity to check for beneficials, things like aureus, which you can see, as well as um, are there predatory thrips. That we've seen see as well so it gives you a good idea about what's going on there um there's the other option which is also using traps so colored sticky traps best mounted above the crop you can use a post like in the image um, using a green cane and elastic band um, typically aiming for about 10 centimeters above the crop is a good idea which you can then check regularly color wise you typically want to be picking uh, blue for thrips because um, that's the, the best attracting colour for Western flower thrips. And also we've done a little bit of prim, preliminary testing um, with previous IPM uh, soft fruit projects um, where we did a little bit of water trapping using different coloured water traps. And we were finding um, more of those other species in the blue traps compared to, say, the yellow. Um, yellow is typically used for monitoring other different species. Um, so the thing with using traps is that they're not going to give you a stronger idea about numbers in the crop. It can be a quick and easy way to look and see whether thrips are present, but they're not gonna give you a good idea of relative numbers per flower. So if you're gonna use the traps, you do also want to be supplementing it with flower inspections because it's a less fine tuned method, but it can be a quick little check, especially early on in the season to sort of determine that yeah, I'm starting to see thrips now, essentially. 
um, and it can start being used into a larger scale. So things like mass monitoring using large roller traps down the edge of a crop um, can be useful for method uh, monitoring on mass. And it also does remove quite a large number of thrips. Now, again, color selection is important. I know that there is one product on the market that uses patterned versions to increase the attractance um, of those colored traps. And then you can start combining it with things like semiochemicals. So Western flower thrips has a sex pheromone that's uh, used to lure in more Western flower thrips. And there has been a number of projects on um, looking into using uh, mass monitoring and these kind of trapping methods for dealing with Western flower thrips as an alternative to just relying on biological controls. Um, we're also doing a little bit of testing in another a new soft fruit project where we are um, using uh, these sticky traps and a generalized attractant called lurum, which is supplied by copper and a generalized repellent, which is Magipal supplied by Russell IPM. And that's looking into the idea of push pull system um, so that we have repellents within the crop and attractants near to those traps to try and pull the thrips away from the crop. Um, and we're still very much in the early stages of that, but I thought it'd be good to note that that's something we're looking into and hoping that it's an alternative, especially if the current trend of losing chemical options starts uh, continuing as well. Um, now with traps and these kind of systems, getting as close to the crop as possible is uh, really quite important. You want that visual lure or cue to be as strong as possible. Um, and I know it's slightly easier in um, soil based crops rather than tabletop to get them closer. In fact, you can have them almost above the crop, um, which increases the sort of efficacy of them. Whereas obviously when you're looking at tabletop crops in like in the image, you've got situations where it's not quite at the crop level. So it's just something to consider. Now I'm going to go into a few sort of naturally occurring beneficials. Now these are, it's not nor, uh, a completely extensive list, to be honest, because as we've seen um, and we've had discussion about various um, biological controls that you can introduce, um, a lot of those biological controls are just artificially reared natural predators that we have that you can find. However, when you're starting to want to get them at certain levels in order to deal with things regularly and in a manner that you can then quantify, use not relying on naturally occurring sort of beneficials can be very helpful. Um, but here's a few examples that I've picked that I've been uh, finding a little bit more. Um, so you've got things like Aeolo thrips, the predatory thrips with those banded wings that you can see there. Um, now they do occur and they do start, I've been seeing them in the last few weeks as I've been in strawberry crops um, and they'll deal with thrips larvae as well, um, which is useful. Hoverfly larvae, just like in this image, I'm starting to see a lot more hoverfly. Now those guys will deal with aphids and I've touched on that a few times already with the aphid presentation we've done. Um, and they will also, as far as I can tell from uh, reading around on the topic, they will also deal with thrips larvae. I'm not entirely sure about thrips adults though, but I would also not be using them as the primary means of control either. Um, you've also got a theta, um, which is a sort of, roving beetle um, and there is actually a fact sheet available for rearing them yourselves so if you're trying to increase the amount of biological control you have available and want to increase the sort of abundance of them within your crop which is good if you're working on a small scale um, there is a fact sheet available which will be on the next page um, and that allows you to rear them in larger numbers and introduce them to the to the crop yourself um, and they'll deal with thrips larvae and pupae as well um, and then we've got aureus, which I've mentioned previously, is also going to be a uh, naturally occurring beneficial. You get a few different species, but also um, is available commercially and is what a lot of people apply supplementally as well. Um, but it depends on the thrips levels and how high the risk is at your sites as to whether you are uh, adding them artificially or just relying on the naturally occurring beneficials that you have. And obviously, having scope and an understanding of how these nat these naturally occurring beneficials are within your crop can also help um, dictate what sort of products and means of control you're going to use because if you're seeing higher numbers of beneficials going in with a very strong insecticide against something that might not be that effective could actually cost you a little bit as Chris top um, discussed very briefly 
Um, are there any other sort of beneficials that I've missed there, Chris, that you can think of? Well, the only th thing we, I'm seeing in the last few days is Anthocaris, but they're very, very similar to Aureus, don't they? Look more or less the same. Yeah, uh, they're a little bit of a larger version, um, but they look very, very similar. So we'll sometimes be confused, but they, they follow the similar kind of patterns to abundance uh, and presence. Um, they'll start appearing when the temperatures start increasing, sort of June, July time. Um, I think they start appearing in crop naturally around July more than June. You can get them in the crop yourself by putting them in in June. Um, but if you're just waiting for the natural ones, then you are going to wait a little bit longer on that front for them to really start appearing in a noticeable level. Um, so there's a few fact sheets that I've kind of picked here that are covering a lot of sort of thrips related issues. They include um, methods of control, but also it's, prob it's worth understanding how it works in other sectors as well. So understanding sort of how they work in ornamental crops can also give you some extra knowledge when dealing with other crops as well. So we've got a couple of fact sheets focused on strawberries that the HDB have published. And there's another one that one of our colleagues, Jude Benison, published on uh, protected ornamentals. Um, and it kind of highlights, again, that wide, wide host range that you see a lot of within uh, thrips. Um, and then there's also the, um, the fact sheet, which is on the rearing of the atheta, the predatory beetle, which can be used if you're looking at supplementing beetles um, in your own time, but then saving money. As another alternative. Um, we have reached the end of this presentation so if there are any questions or specific examples that people want to highlight or if there's any sort of tales that people have got about methods of control that they've used that they'd like to throw into the mix that would be very good um, or if there's any questions that I've missed on the chat which I can't seem to view unfortunately. I think that's just the way with me screen sharing how it shows me. Okay. I was in um, five crops of strawberries in Wales last week, and uh, there was thrips in all of them. So they are definitely about, you know, at the moment. So make yeah. sure that you keep a regular eye on your crops. And um, if you're taking um, EC readings every day, then do a, a pest walk. But um, thrips, like uh, the other pests, can be patchy. So make sure you do, you know, at least a W shape in your tunnels and cover a lot of ground with it because they. They tend to be on the outside of tunnels when they first come in, if they're coming in from the weeds, but have a good thorough walk through, tapping out plenty of flowers. And the more you know about these pests, um, forearmed is forewarned, and you can um, take your dealings with it. The other thing I did see on my travels was I saw, um, which is typical of Wales, really, I saw a, a, a multi span uh, polytunnel with four different crops in it. So pesticide options there are non existent. But um, they've got a bad dose of red spider mite in the strawberries and you know, they're likely to spread into the tomatoes, etc. So it's really good in those situations to put predators on. And in that case, we went for um, phytosiolus, put them on the strawberries because they were starting to get webbed over. It's not ideal for this year, but um, they're saving that crop for next year. So come September, that, that crop will probably be cleaned up. And I find that um, those predators will move to all the other crops in there because all the other crops were likely to get red spider mite as well. So um, the other thing they did do there was they put up a couple of aphid bottles. And I think, you know, the, the aphid scout, the mixed aphid packs, um, we've been doing an IPDM uh, monitoring um, evaluation in Wales on two farms. And um, notably, uh, they're saying that uh, with the putting the bottles in early, I mean, these things will fly, so you don't need to distribute them uh, very carefully. And uh, they've been, uh, you know, a very good addition to the uh, rain. Yeah, the species mixes with the parasitoids are particularly good. And I've seen a lot of um, one specific species of uh, parasitoid that you only get in those mixes, and that seems to be pretty effective. Um, and so I see a fair amount of that. Um, and as Chris said, monitoring the crop regularly if you're going out and about, you may as well just have a quick poke around. When you start, as soon as you get your eye in for these kind of um, pests, you'll start spotting them quite quickly and it won't take you much time, but it'll then help dictate how you're going to start using biologicals. Because if you're forewarned about um, early stages of um, pests appearing, then getting biologicals in early, in, especially in a preventative manner, is very, very useful. 
Um, and I can't stress enough that most of these biologicals are used preventatively, not curatively, especially when you're trying to do it in a cost effective manner. Um, it gets quite expensive to use them curatively, depending on the uh, beneficial that you're introducing. So if you've got them in nice and early and you're comfortable with looking for them, then it will help alleviate a lot of issues. Um, I didn't put the slide in today that I've put in the previous two uh, presentations, which was happy site, uh, clean site, happy life, um, where removing weeds and other sort of habitat areas is very useful and important. Um, We've also had a number of um, emergency uh, emus. You could follow uh, them on the AHDB um, website, but um, we've been allowed to use um, one or two uh, more recent um, examples of chemistry and um, whether they're effective on threats or not, we're not sure, but um, you're only supposed to use them for spotted wing drosophila, so, uh, but they, they are likely to have some incidental control. Yeah, and it, it's still in the early days of determining whether the, use, uh, the loss of calypso, which was typically applied for um, things like strawberry blossom weevil and things like encapsids, the loss of that is likely to have a knock-on effect with thrips numbers as well and i wouldn't be surprised if we start to see slightly higher levels of some of the species th than we've previously seen because calypso has often been applied at around the sort of time of year where these migratory thrips will start coming in so yeah that's a good point now Peter, because this is the you know this is the point of this um tv coming in the train you need to you need to know what's in your crop and what levels so it's no good just popping into the crop, seeing a bit of blo blossom weevil and um, various other things and just sort of think, oh, well, I'll get a spray on for them. But you could actually be making your thrips a lot worse. Blossom weevil will, will knock out you know, some flowers, but uh, with thrips, you can lose a whole lot. So it's just, um, you know, keeping the context of the level of infestation, really. And that's, you know, it's quite hard to learn. But, um, you know, we've seen a fair few pictures of slides, but more or less all thrips are bad, like all aphids are bad. And, um, the big decision then is what action you do take and it's a bit like swd you know if that comes in about now or a bit later then you know you've got to be able to take decisions on it and act on it yeah and it's it's one of those issues as well that pests will vary very heavily dependent on the local area they'll depend on the local uh, sort of biological geography other woodlands hedgerows that sort of thing areas or points of intrusion for your crops so understanding general having a good understanding of trends year on year can also help you so if you know that okay i seem to have a problem uh in this corner of the field or this end of the polytunnel year on year that seems to be the point where they're first appearing maybe because they're coming from that air particular area um or the prevailing wind is coming from this direction then next year you're then able to start monitoring in a good manner in the areas where you start to see them a little bit earlier so having an idea of keeping sort of notes or a log of where you're starting to see things and when can be very, very beneficial year on year. And you can start building up a good core understanding of how things are at a site um, or at your site. I've had a few instances where I've looked at Google images of sites and started to kind of get a mental idea of where maybe I'd start looking for things like thrips. But no, local knowledge is better. And it will give you, if you're able to keep a solid understanding of what's going on, then it will benefit you quite a lot over, a lot, over the years as things develop. Um, and I think that's exhausted most of my points. So if there are any final questions that people have, then happy to, to take any more. We have a few, uh, Michael, I don't know if you've got any experience of um, pest and disease control this year and how you're managing. Mr. Hooten, unmute. Un unmute. Right. And I, I didn't actually catch that the question was levelled at me. <laughs> um, it's just uh, any, any local experience. I mean, you've got um, several crops. Well, um, you're doing a 60 day programme. You've got lots of flowers appearing. 60 day tend to flower over a very short time, so they're very vulnerable. So you need to be in them all the time. How, how are you finding it? Well, we did put insecticide on after your visit and we've looked closely again today and there are still a few thrips around. Um, that's on the first flowering crop. 
the ones that are just coming into flower. Um, I'm struggling to find anything at the moment, but we're watching them very closely. Um, well, you, you reckon you had some, some success with that insecticide? Well, I'm hoping so, but there certainly aren't as many coming onto our hands now as there were when you were with us the other day. Yeah, I didn't think they were Western flower trips, so you might have some success with Tracer, but um, you know, it's worth um, definitely worth the try in that crop. And if you reach the point where you do want to send samples in, I'm hesitant to be discussing it, but we do we do a lab analysis as well as part of ADAS. That is an option that we can discuss if you just want to get in contact with Chris or myself, um, depending on how things go. Um, but it's good to, it's good that there's examples where thrips are being dealt with. Um, and as Chris said, there's some pests where which will be more panic inducing than others. And having an understanding of what's the big risk for you is also very useful. The other thing that uh, Peter mentioned was a theta. And I think if you're on this uh, situation where you've got tunnels with mixed crops in and ornamentals and uh, edible crops, et cetera, or propagation houses or permanent structures, the theta is uh, a very useful resource. And um, if you get the fact sheets and rear a few and get them going in there, then they, they sort of, I think they're mainly ground based, aren't they, Peter? And they, they, they look out all the thrips pupa and the thrips pupa drop to the ground mostly and then um, you know they, they are quite vulnerable when they hatch out on the ground yeah and also actually thinking about that point um we there's a general idea that tabletops will be a little bit better at dealing with pupae um because if they drop to the ground on a leaf that's over the edge of the tabletop they'll just drop straight to the ground um which means they're probably in grass or whatever you've got underneath the tabletops um whereas the other one um whereas in soil based crops they can just drop straight into the the soil find a good pupation spot so it's something to consider there as well is the method that you're growing a lot of the crops um it's interesting chris that you've got experience with crops multi-cropping within a polytunnel um and at that point you want to be using sort of generalized predators that will cover a wide range of things um a wide range of pests um because as you say, chemical options are very, very limited unless you're going around with a knapsack. Yeah, I think it's quite typical in Wales to see um, you know, multi-cropping systems and um, you know, it's a big help if you can um, like put some aphid bottles in because they, they've got five or six species of wasp and they'll have a go at most aphids. So you don't need to worry about what particular aphids are in that particular crop. So I think it's uh, you know quite encouraging that um, as we get to understand our PDM on mixed systems, it's um, certainly working out well. Mm. I, I, I did I I did put in Ambacillus cucumeris, uh, the mighty mite, and uh, Hypoestes miles in about sort of May time, because I noticed there was a little bit of damage on on um, some of the uh, plugs that I was about to pop, and that that seems to have really helped. It's a good point as well, Andrew, about checking plugs and plants as they come in. Um, you having a good inspection when plants come onto your site is very helpful, um, and it also means that you get an early indication, or also an indication if you want to be having a word with the propagator about things that have come in. Um, <laughs> So, in, in this case, I was the propagator as well. <laughs> in that case, no comment. Um, but yeah, no, having a good idea when you're um, planting as to what pests are around um, is useful. And like you say, Andrew, by put, you saw them in May, so you were able to get something in nice and early. Have you had many issues since then or seen much? I no, no. And I, it seems to be it seems to be quite clean all, all the way around to whether whether the because I I'm often scurrying around on the map looking for the high prestige miles and the map mighty might as well. And uh, they st still seem to be about under the trays and things. So that's good. It's good. Yeah. One thing um, I've seen, I often see thrips in raspberries, but they don't seem to do the same devastation that they do in strawberries. No, um, most, and just from the areas of research that I've been sort of aimed at is that a lot of the research currently is aimed at strawberry. 
I was unaware that there was a predatory threat. Um, uh, apart from the banding, is is there any other way of identifying it? Does it sort of? Uh, it's slightly larger. So if you are seeing, and um, we're talking over a period of time, if you're seeing thrips on a regular basis, then you might be able to get your eye in. Um, but you can, I, I should have taken a photo. I saw one uh, the other week in a flower and you could see that banding down its back um, right. with with the eye but that's also me knowing it exists, I guess. So I knew what I was looking for. Right. Uh, but you could see it with a hand lens as well. Um, so it's, it's a little bit more distinctive than the others, which is useful because it means if you're seeing large numbers of beneficials, I've seen sites where sort of around every 25 thrips, you might find two or three kind of predatory. Um, but or there's been other sites where there's been more than that. Um, so they are around a lot of the time. Um, and so it's useful being able to understand them, especially because of those low thresholds we were discussing. If you see them, then um, you're also able to distinguish what's going to be bad and what's actually useful for you before you start considering things like sprays. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I might say all flips are the same, but those big stripy ones do stand out and they're quite easy to see. So. Um, if you get your hand lens out, you'll see the big stripy ones and, the, you know, you've got some predatory thrips in your crops. Yeah. And then you'll start noticing them more and more. And then the size difference will become, they're a little bit bulkier, essentially, and a little bit longer. Um, but when you know that and you're used to recognising them, then you'll start to pick out them a little bit quicker. Um, and as Chris has said, it's useful just to know when you've got, for once, when you've got something nice in the crop that's helping. It's always nice to see once in a while. Well, I think, I think that's the part of your crop walking is to, um, you know, sort the, um, the sheep from the goats, is it? But um, you find out what's good and what's bad and then um, you get, you know, then you get to know your crops. And um, if you start seeing a lot of wild predators coming in, then it's all good. And it shows that your crop management isn't just sort of chemical mayhem. So you're best to, um, you know, visit the crop often and... Um, take notice of the circumstances. Like I say, you know, don't rush in if you see the odd blossom weed, or don't rush in if you see a bit of capsid. You know, you can live with a bit of that, and especially on picture angles, you know, people are picked through with capsid, and then sometimes it's red, and, you know, it's not like supermarket stuff where everything gets rejected. So, you know, it's, um, it gives you a chance to just relax a bit, but, um, you know, always consider with your crop walk, what, what actions are you going to take? And um, speaking about the bronzing damage earlier, a lot of those photos that I was using are photos of bronzing on white fruit when it's the most distinctive. Now, at high percentages, you are still going to see it on the red fruit and supermarkets would reject it. But you, as Chris says, you might get a bit more leeway with pick your own. Um, but also, if it's only a few percent of damage, we're talking low level thrips abundance, then you're starting you when it transitions over from white to red fruit, you're probably not going to notice it um, as readily. Um, so it's just another sort of benefit if things are a little bit lower or lower down, or you've got less discerning customers. Yeah, that's a good point, Peter. Because um, if you go into a crop and um, nearly all the fruit is set, you started picking, but there is the odd flower. A, all the thrips will go in that flower, and B probably wouldn't make a fruit anyway so you know I wouldn't worry about that so hmm. it, is, it is all about this context of you know if there's only 15 flowers in in the whole crop then all the thrips are going to be in those 15 flowers yeah we when we're doing a lot of our assessments we'll typically do a flower count on a plant or on a number of plants to get a rough idea of an average say okay there's two flowers per plant normally and then we're finding say five thrips per flower but you might then, and it helps inform your decision making as to whether it's going to be a massive issue. But if you've got lots of a high average of flowers per plant and you're seeing high levels of thrips, then you know you, you've got to start moving. Yep. Can I uh, pass to you for some time sheets? Yeah, but not now. Not now. All right. <laughs> okay. 
Well, thank you both um, Peter and Chris for a really informative session. And thank you all for attending um, today. You will see I've put a link to a survey. We'd be really grateful if you could complete. And if anyone does have any um, you know, comments or suggestions for future sessions, please do um, email me. And thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you.